This is Jonah, and he's overboard. A few minutes ago, he was up here with these guys, but they threw him into the sea. To understand why, let's back up. Jonah was a prophet. He got messages from God and delivered them to people. God will restore our land. Everything was fine until God gave him this message. Dear Nineveh, in 40 days you will be destroyed. Jonah didn't like the message, and he really didn't like Nineveh. So he did what any of us might do when confronted with the clear, unchanging will of an all-powerful God. He ran. He ran in the opposite direction of Nineveh. And he didn't stop at the sea. He kept going on this boat with these guys. Until they realized that Jonah was the cause of this horrible storm that tossed their ship. And they tossed him overboard. That's when Jonah met the very big fish. Fish stomachs are strange places. But they get you thinking about life. And Jonah realized he'd made a mess of his. He decided that God's way is the best way, no matter what. And he got the chance to prove it. Jonah arrived in Nineveh, a foreign city filled with godless people. He knew his mission. He held his message. All that remained was a choice. Speak or run. 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed! With those words, Jonah went overboard again. Not like a fool being tossed to the sea, but like a man diving headfirst into destiny. And something wonderful happened. People were saved. A triumph of mercy sent in motion by one man, armed with eight words and the decision to stop running and start talking. That is the story of Jonah. And the really big fish. That's gonna leave a stink. That is, of course, a small part of the story of Jonah. The rest of it we will be uncovering uh, over the course of the summer. And I'm really excited about uh, this study in the book of Jonah. When uh, I was really starting to cut my teeth spiritually and kind of grow up in uh, my faith, I was uh, a part of churches. And we would simply start at the beginning of a book of the Bible and we would work our way through it, um, nearly going verse by verse, just working our way straight through a book um, for uh, however long it took to understand fully and completely the message. And that's really the style that we're going to be pursuing this summer. We're going to be spending, it's four chapters, and we're going to be spending the duration of the summer uh, unfolding, unpacking, and trying to get inside this uh, incredible little narrative. Now, as a series, Jonah and the Cautionary Well, I think we're going to learn a lot about what it means to be a Christian and to follow God. Uh, we're going to be asking questions about what's our place in the world and what is my responsibility in the world. We're going to try to figure out a, a whole host of applications as we study the life or this particular segment of Jonah's life. Because this book really does flirt with a lot of the answers to these kinds of questions. And most of all, it stands as a cautionary tale about resisting God. And so uh, I'm really excited about it. I think it's going to be a, a great uh, a great series. I know that for me personally, the study of the Bible has been a huge part of my development as a Christ follower. And so uh, this should be, uh, I hope, I hope uh, for many of you, a similar experience. This morning, we're going to be exploring the importance and the impact of a word from God, of a word from God, and kind of looking at this idea of as a follower of Christ, what is it that we are supposed to be living for. Now, most of you probably know someone at this point, most everyone does, knows somebody with Alzheimer's. Uh, I think most of us have some sort of experience with some relative or friend or something that has it. My uh, grandmother did uh, for about like 10 years, and uh, it was, uh, it's a really uh, 
disturbing uh, kind of a uh, disease. Well, one of the things that is common is, before, especially before you sort of know what's going on, people's, people with Alzheimer's often begin to wander away for no apparent reason. And they have an idea as to where they're going, but of course, they, they can't actually navigate that. Well, there was a place in Germany, a facility, a, a hospital, that uh, they were having this problem that their Alzheimer's patients were escaping. They were finding a way out, and they were kind of sneaking out, and then they would wander off, and they would just disappear uh, into the community looking for whatever they were looking for. So, of course, this is a pretty significant problem. You're starting to lose patients. Uh, no, literally, not patients, patients. Uh, anyway, you, they're losing the people. And, uh, and so uh, they're losing the people, and so some guy has this idea. He's like, you know what? Let's build a fake bus stop. So that's what they do. A lot of people didn't like the idea, but they, they, so they built, it's in Germany, they built a fake bus stop right out front of this hospital. So of course, the patients would, they would kind of sneak out, and they knew they had to get out, and they knew they had to get away, but since they didn't really know where they were going, they would see the bus stop, and they would decide to wait for the bus to leave. So they would sit down at the bus stop, and uh, eventually a nurse, well, they would see them, and a nurse would come on out and just sit down at the bus stop with them, and just chat it up for a little while while they waited for the bus. That, of course, was never coming. And then eventually they would forget why they were sitting at the bus stop, which is normal. And the nurse would say, hey, would you like to come back in for a nice cup of tea? To which they would always say, sure. And they would walk right back in without a fight. So it worked. They were catching patients all the time who were trying to escape. And that is, of course, a clever solution. And it's just a wee bit cute. And, of course, it is also depressingly sad that this is what so many will look forward to and how many of us actually live this way regularly. We sort of just meander about, not really sure what we're doing or where we're going. We have some sense that something has to happen and so we start wandering off and then all of a sudden we are distracted by this or by that. We're sitting at a fake bus stop with nowhere really to go. The importance of purpose in life cannot be overstated. Otherwise, someone's going to come along and they're going to just offer you a nice cup of tea to draw you back into your little hovel where you will again restlessly wonder what you were supposed to be doing. A study was done in, uh, recently about the value of purpose. It was a long-term 14-year study. It tracked 6,100 Americans from ages 20 to 75. Pretty extensive study. They found out when other variables were controlled for that having a purpose in life made you live longer. It increased your longevity. Other studies have been done, of course, talking about happiness and satisfaction in life and all of these things. This one was the first to determine that you actually live longer when you have a purpose a reason to live. And if the scriptures are true, if the promises of God are true, you live a lot longer than, than they know. Because if you live on purpose for God, you've been granted the gift of eternal life as well. It's extremely important to know that God, he has a purpose for your life. There is no need to meander aimlessly around, to wait at some fake bus stop. See, God loves all of his creation. He loves it desperately. And he is sending you to show it. You have a reason. If you'd open up in a Bible to the book of Jonah, the book of Jonah, we'll begin to get a sense of it even in the first few verses. While you guys are opening up, uh, just a word about the genre of Jonah. A lot of folks, you go back and forth. If you read the material on it, there's a lot of discussion as to what genre this book is. It's very different from the other prophets. And so it's counted among the 12 minor prophets of the Old Testament, but it's a very, very different kind of a book. And so some people, that has led many people to say that it's really a satirical kind of a book, that it was never meant, it never actually took place. It was just like an, nearly an epic story or a play that would teach a valuable point. And that, of course, deals with all sorts of other issues, all of the kind of more 
uh, amazing sorts of stories. They just go, well, it wasn't actually intended. It's, it's not an historical book, so you don't really have to worry about it. Um, and there is some things to be said for that, that view. Uh, it is clearly written in a very uh, poetic style. There are also others, including me, who would say that is true, but it also bears many of the marks of being historical. And so, you know, you have an actual character that has a reference in another part of the scripture in 2 Kings, Jonah. He's, he was a prophet. He did speak at a time that fits historically with the rest of, of the story here. And so we understand that there, was, there were these various empires and there were various kings and these things really very well could have happened. And since I don't have a problem with miracles, I don't have to go looking for a reason not to trust it. And that's usually the main motivation that people have. You know, but once you grant the existence of God, you really don't ha have any reason. Yeah, if you grant that God exists, you have to at least assume for the possibility of miracles. And that means really we shouldn't have any issue with the, with the possibility of miracles happening even today. And certainly not when we're reading about them here. And it's told in a fairly straightforward way. It reads as if somebody was recounting a story that took place, a real historical moment. All right, so the date. Jonah preached sometime around 770 BC, and the background to it is the movements of the Assyrian Empire. We have a map about, uh, the, about the region. So if you see the kind of the light green area, this was the Assyrian Empire their area of influence or control around 670 BC. All right? So they covered this massive area. Much of Israel had to pay tribute to the Assyrian Empire. And so they were constantly under threat from Assyria. They had a massive, massive empire. However, by 824, they had been reduced to the still massive area, but the dark green, darker green area. So if you notice, there's on the left on the coast, you'll see Samaria and Tyre and Sidon, Damascus, Jerusalem right there in the middle, and Judah, right? That little kind of yellowish spot. Well, that's Israel. So Assyria had been beaten back. They had retracted as a kingdom in the 100 years, or the 200 years between 800 and 600. And Jonah happens somewhere in the 700s, about 770. So the Assyrian Empire was in full contraction at that point which gives the northern kingdom of Israel a great deal of renewed vigor. They're no longer under constant threat from Assyria. They, they were under threat still. And eventually the Assyrian empire would rise again. So after Jonah's time, Assyria would actually become an instrument of God to bring just a terrible, terrible time into Israel's history. So the expansion and the contraction of these happened, our story happens at a time when Assyria had been beaten back and there was kind of, I don't want to call it a golden age because the golden age of Israel happened under King Solomon. This is uh, quite a few years later, but this is as close to a golden age. This is like a silver age that the northern kingdom ever experienced while they were a divided monarchy. So this allowed Israel, when you start talking about Nineveh and Assyria to the Israelites, they remember the oppression. They know that they're always a threat. They understand that they have already been here, they have already done horrible things, and they're always nervous that one day they would again, because they had massive, massive imperialistic desires. All right. So what do we learn in verse 1, chapter 1? I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. I like this because the word of the Lord came, you'll see that in the very first verse. To me, this captures the idea that God initiates the mission. See, the word of the Lord comes. It's God's initiative. He does it. He starts off this book. This book starts abruptly because it's God's initiative, his concern, his love, that prompts this mission. And I think this is an important bit of biblical studies. God always initiates. You'll see this time and time again. From the very beginning. What are the, what's the first, what are the first words in the Bible? In the beginning, God created. His initiative. 
Then he goes on to create this beautiful planet, the animals, the food for all of his creatures, and Adam and Eve, all his initiative. Then after the rebellion and the fall, God goes looking for Adam and Eve. He gives them the garments to cover their nakedness, his initiative. All of his initiative is rooted in his great love, his compassion, his concern, his great mercy toward all of his creation. Later on, when God sought to turn the tide, when humanity's decline was, was uh, very much apparent, he wanted to find someone who would stand and declare his great love. So he called Abraham, Genesis 12, chapter 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, he was called Abram then, go. Go. Once again, God's initiative. See, we often forget this. We like to talk about seeking God. And that's good. We should seek God. That's a good thing to do. But the primary direction in this relationship is God seeking you. It's God seeking me. We like to think of it, oh yeah, I'm so busy seeking God. It's a good thing that I do that. But you see, God is seeking you. And for some of you, this, this is important to hear because you wonder sometimes if God really does care about you. You wonder if he really does have some sort of a plan for you. You wonder if he wants to have a relationship with you. And every page of the Bible says he does. He does. He has taken the initiative and he does it time and time again. What will you do with that? Changes the dynamic of our relationship just a little bit, doesn't it? See, when you view this whole Christian thing as your own little spiritual project, then if nothing happens, it's just because, well, you didn't pursue it. I mean, it's no big deal, right? I didn't do it. Well, you know, I'll get to it because it's mine. It's my responsibility. It's my initiative. So I'll get to it. One of these days, maybe when I have kids, maybe when the kids get older, maybe when they're teenagers and I'm going out of my mind. One of these days, maybe when I have time, when I'm not doing immoral stuff anymore, maybe I'll come back and I'll cycle around to this relationship and I'll see how things go then because it's all my initiative. But it isn't. It's his. And when we don't act on it, we are actually rejecting him. See, it changes the dynamic of the relationship. How many of you remember the days when you're, you are dating maybe or you were dating? Maybe you were dating your spouse. Who in this, who, those of you who are in a, in a coupled up right now, how many of you were the pursuer? How many of you were the pursuer, right? Pursuer, a couple, late, yes, great. Couple, do we have no one who's willing to admit they were the pursuer? You're right. You had to pursue it, right? All right, you're the pursuer in the relationship. Now, when you're the pursuer, it really, it changes things for you. Because now you go out there, you give it all, you, you get your heart out there, you lay it out, tell me that I'm not right. And then you're rejected. It's like, oh, heartbreaking. It's, I did everything I could. It's different when you're, you're the one who's being pursued. You see, but when you're, can you put yourself in the position of the pursuer for a moment? You see, this is the role of God. He's pursuing you. He's putting it all out there. He's laying it out in front of you, and he's saying, I love you. I have a plan for you. What will you do with it? The word of the Lord came and initiates this great mission. And in this word from the Lord, we learn that God's great compassionate concern extends beyond his people. Look at verse 2. Go to the great city of Nineveh, and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Now, Nineveh, of course, was one of, it was a city of great importance. On again, off again, capital of Assyria. It wasn't quite the, this is an actual photograph of ancient, uh, of ancient Nineveh. I'm just kidding, you can't. Uh, this is an artist's rendition of even just one of their great temples, considered to be one of the most amazing cities of antiquity. It's in northern Iraq cross from a soul. And in Jonah's day, though it wasn't the capital, it was still a very great city and it represented Assyria. Because back in Genesis chapter 10, we're given this indication that the Assyrian empire was built upon these great city-states, Nineveh, Nineveh being the first and the premier of them. And so it had come to represent all 
of the birth and cruelty and imperialistic lusts of the Assyrian Empire. When you speak about the great power of this amazing empire, Nineveh would have quickly come to mind. And this commission for Jonah was unique. We do not have another prophet that was sent in this way to a cruel and fierce nation that was often threatening Israel. We don't have anything like this. We have prophets condemning other, other countries in the midst of the chosen people, but we don't have something like this. This stands alone in the scriptures to tell us that God, he isn't merely concerned with his people. He has a tender concern, a fatherly care for those who don't know him. And this would be quite a surprise to many of the ancient Hebrews that God here is seeking to show his mercy to a wicked nation. Now, I think sometimes it's easy for Christians to think that God's work is really solely with us and for us. And yet this stands against that idea. We forget that God has always had a mission to the world. The original creation through the Tower of Babel and Sodom and Gomorrah, the prophets often would work outside of their own nationalistic lines. And you just need to jump into the New Testament to see how aggressively that would be pursued later. You know, he loves, God loves Boston and Baghdad. He loves San Francisco and San Paolo. He loves Chicago and Cairo. He loves New York. And he loves everywhere that isn't New York. It's helpful, important, essential for Christians to realize that God is not the God of Christians alone. He's the God of this world. Whether the world realizes it or not, he is. And in this, he wasn't promising condemnation to them. This, the language here is rather difficult, and scholars struggle with it. You see in verse 2, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. They struggle with this because this, the idea of preaching against it uh, had been, the nuances of it could go in a few different directions. One of the ancient translations, the Septuagint, talks about preaching within it. The word evil here is often used of calamity. So it isn't just their wickedness, but it's quite possible that some, some horrible thing has befallen Nineveh. So it isn't simply about a prophet going there and yelling at them. That's how it, it can often read to us. But this might very well describe the act, an act of compassion this is, would explain a lot of what Jonah says later on. That some great calamity had befallen this wicked people. And God wanted to show his mercy. He wanted to call them back and give them another chance. There was a guy, he was driving home from work. And he was pulled over for not wearing a seatbelt. So a week later, he's driving through this the same way back home from work. Got the ticket the first week. A week later, the same cop pulls him over. Not wearing a seatbelt. Same ticket. Two weeks, two tickets. So the cop says to him, so have you learned anything? And the, co the guy says to him, yeah, I, I learned I need to drive home another way from work. <laughs> really? Because <laughs> we like to look at the police officers as the ones who are doing nothing but judging us, giving us grief, writing us tickets. But why can't you actually take him for what he's saying? He wants you to be safe. He might actually care. See, we view God as this angry sort of God who's just always looking for judgment. By offering the, the threat of judgment coming, he gives us a chance to turn. He gives us a chance to be restored, to seek forgiveness. And I think God is determined to show his deep and his patient compassion on this evil city because he loves them. And so because of this deep compassion, God sends his people to help. And he is always sending his people somewhere to do something. You saw that. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, verse 1. There's always a royal element in these commissions, by the way. This idea of being sent came out of the royal court. Somebody would send one of their great trusted people. And they would send them on a mission and they would become ambassadors, emissaries of the king and represent the king's values abroad. 
But sometimes when the word of the Lord comes, God's people don't want to go. We refuse. We disobey. See, usually when God sends someone, it goes something like this. The word of the Lord came to John. And John goes and does whatever the word of the Lord says. So the word of the Lord comes to James, and James, you go and do whatever the word of the Lord said to do. Genesis 12, 1, that verse we looked at before. Now the Lord said to Abram, go. And then a few verses later, it says, so Abram went, as the Lord told him. Good advice. The Lord says, go, always good advice. Now, it doesn't always go down that way. Occasionally, the word of the Lord comes to someone. Let's say the word of the Lord comes to Trevor. And Trevor says, no, 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 can't do it. No can do, God. Nope, not ready, not able, not equipped, not, can't do it. And God says, yes, you can. And Trevor goes, okay, fine. This is another way that the word of the Lord comes and God's people generally respond. Like Moses, Exodus chapter 3. He says, so now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israels out, Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And Moses is like, oh, all right, I'll go. We see it with Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me saying, I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I'm too young. But the Lord said to me, don't say I'm too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and he touched my mouth and said to me, I have put my words in your mouth. See, that's happened sometimes. No, no, I can't do it. And God's like, yes, you can. No, 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 I can't. Yes, you can go. No, I can't. Yes, you're, just go. Go. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you, even to the end of the age. Jonah, of course, doesn't do any of this. Verse 3. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. You know, this wasn't a mistake. This wasn't even a really big mistake. So many of us have made big mistakes. We know what it means to make a big mistake. I was reading recently that France ordered like 2,000 brand new trains. It was like a $20 billion train upgrade. And then they got the trains, and they're all nice and shiny and beautiful, but they're too big for their platforms. They don't fit. <laughs> Somebody didn't measure right. <laughs> That's a big mistake. That's a $20 billion mistake. That's not what happens here for Jonah. Jonah didn't misunderstand. He didn't head in the... We can often make mistakes. That's not what's going on here. This is a rebellious act of disobedience. You know, God, he doesn't... God's people, they don't run in the opposite direction. You can see, you know, he's, he, he's in Gath Hepfer. He's told to go to Nineveh. He heads down to Joppa and then off to Tarshish. You know, God said, go. Jonah thinks, no, not going to do it. God goes, tells him to go up to Nineveh. He goes down to Joppa. He's called east. He goes west. And he doesn't protest he doesn't even take the second route. He doesn't even say, no, 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 I can't, but you don't understand, but these people, but I don't want to do... Nothing. Silent. He just goes in the opposite direction. You know, if he has a problem with it, why not talk to God about it? If he's fearful, ask for courage. If he feels ill-equipped, then, then pray that God would do it. He did it for Jeremiah. He can send along the help, the support, the encouragement that we need if it's about fear and doubts, but of course... That's not what happened. He goes down to Joppa, a Gentile port. He chose a port where he wouldn't meet God's people, where he wouldn't be around them. He chose a place, Tarshish, where he could be as far away from the revelation of God as is conceivable. And off he goes. We're going to talk a lot more about that next week. See, sometimes God's people refuse to do what God commissions them to do. So how about you? We know this applies to us. We understand what he's doing. I came across a quote, Theodore Roosevelt. He said, if you could kick the person in the pants responsible for most of your trouble, you wouldn't sit for a month. <laughs> 
See, God loves his creation. He loves his creation very much, and he is sending you to share and to show his great love. Matthew chapter 10, he says, Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel, and as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Matthew chapter 28, he says, therefore go. This is to you, this is to me. Therefore go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So will you refuse this holy commission? Because you're called by God to go. So will you. There are so many ways that we resist God. So many ways that we avoid our divine calling. We can ignore the word. We plug up our ears. We can argue with God and make excuses. We can turn and run. We stay so busy that we simply drown out the word of God in our lives. We immerse ourselves in a culture. Or we try to live among a people where we can't hear the word of God. Drown it out. Maybe we just harden our hearts. Why didn't Jonah go? Lots of reasons. I'm sure we'll, we'll, we're going to explore some of them, but at the very heart of it, he didn't have the Father's compassion. He didn't care. Not like God does. He didn't care. Not enough to do what God had called him to do. He had no semblance of God's deep compassion. Otherwise, he never would have run the other way. So what will you do? Are you going to harden your heart to the plight, lack compassion that God has for his creation? You know, we often forget just how powerfully the word of God can come to each and every one of us. This is why we talk about studying God's word. We just read two passages. There are countless more where God is directly giving you a charge, a commission, there you go. You want to know what God wants? A big part of it is already captured in the word that has been handed down to us. A word from the Lord has already come. The scriptures. Are you reading them? Do you even know what they are? What, do you know what this charge is to you? Do you know the commission? Dedicate yourself to becoming a student of the word of God. There are times you'll get a direct commission, just like the ones we read. You'll know exactly what he wants you to do. And other times, what you'll start to get a sense of is you'll have a unique situation in your life and you won't really know when you'll be asking God, what do you want me to do here? And one day you'll be reading a story. It seems unrelated, but at the end of it, you realize it was for you, that it was providential. It wasn't a coincidence that you were reading this particular thing at this particular time. This happened to me a number of times in my life where I, afterwards I realized, wow, that was a word of, of the Lord to me about this situation. And I'm going to do it. I got to do it. He just told me what's next for me. The word of God the actual scriptures that we have today. It also comes through prayer. And this comes in two forms as well, does it not? There is actually direct speech. Every once in a while, I hear of a person who says, God told me. And I always want to know, did he, did you hear it? Because that could be a really cool thing. It could mean that you're hearing voices. And you know, it's, it could cut either way. Like maybe you did, and that's great. If you did, and it really is from God, that's fantastic. It can't be much more clear than that. My experience has been that more often, it happens more like the impression, more like a settled certainty that, that, that comes into your life. You know where you're supposed to go and what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to be and what you're supposed to do for this person and that person, and you just sort of know it. As a result of this ongoing conversation with God, the fact that you will now know Jesus through the scriptures and through prayer, you will simply know what the word of the Lord is to you. So you can cultivate this. You can actually go after it, or you can neglect it. So listen, running from God is going to come at a very high cost. There are serious consequences. Don't do it. Because you have a grand purpose in this world. God loves all of his creation. He is sending you to it, to share it, to prove it to them. Be a part of it. Don't miss out on it. Let's pray. Lord, we're asking that you would help us to soften up our own hearts, that we would not in any way hear your word and run in the other direction, that we wouldn't flee from your presence, that we would in fact 
know that we have been given a great privilege, that your word comes. It's your great initiative to us, that you show your love, that you, your love goes beyond uh, our own tribal, territorial boundaries, and it goes deep into this world, and that you, Father, are sending us to share that love, that each and every day we can wake with a renewed purpose to bring your message of hope, of mercy, of repentance, and real life to a world that needs it and a world that you love. We ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.